All right, before we get started, um, me very briefly, so I'm still thinking about how to do the final exam. So the options are doing basically synchronous exam as we did uh, for the midterm, but given that people are distributed over so many time zones, it might be a little bit tricky. So um, the uh, department suggests doing a take home exam, so we might do that which would probably give you like a day to do the exam. And um, the other option is um, just extend the time for the last homework and just um, just do the homeworks and not do an exam. Um, so I haven't entirely decided. I'll uh, update you like the next couple of days about that. So for the next, I think, three lectures, so we'll um, dive a little bit more deeply into neural networks. Neural you know, networks are like a really broad topic and have become more and more popular over the last couple of years. So we'll only be able to like uh, skim the surface on this. Today will be a pretty like slow introduction and um, we'll go into a little bit more depth in uh, the next two lectures. So we'll probably uh, mostly cover like you know, networks for tabular data and for uh, computer vision. There's been a lot of developments in um, text processing recently, but I think this is probably going to uh, go beyond the scope of the lecture. So I, I um, alluded to this a little bit in the last lecture, and there's a little bit on it on the homework. But I think uh, if we really want to go uh, through sequence models and bird with um, the lecture, it would take us like another week or so that we don't have. So as is traditional, I will start with a little bit of history on neural networks. The thing is that most of the things I'll talk about today uh, already existed in about 1990. So this is, people say often like, oh, um, are you do cycle learns for traditional machine learning and then there's deep learning, but actually deep learning uh, predates most of like SVMs and random forests and so on. So um, it's actually somewhat older but uh, it hadn't been used for uh, a while. So some people call this like the neural network winter uh, when during most of the 90s and the 2000s, people were not really uh, using neural networks that much. And more recently, uh, obviously everybody is using neural networks now. So uh, as I said, there has been uh, a bunch of progress in particular in uh, natural language processing, but a lot of the things that really uh, are people that people are using a lot these days. Uh, the principles are about 30 years old already. Um, but the main things that changed uh, that we now have a lot more data. So basically, uh, when I started my PhD, uh, people were, were working on convolutional neural networks in like um, 2008, 2009, but there wasn't really enough data to really train uh, convolutional neural networks on, uh, on natural and realistic images. And this only really changed when, um, when ImageNet was created. And so having more uh, training data was like a, a huge benefit uh, for neural networks. Uh, the second one is uh, faster computers, in particular having GPUs. And so um, this is something that really started in the, at the end of the 2000s and then really became popular in the 2010s, that um, neural networks mostly consist of uh, matrix multiplications for computer vision, also of convolutions that we'll talk about next time, or maybe next week. Um, and these are really operations that can benefit a lot from um, specialized hardware. And so most of the neural networks that we um, uh, that are used today need to be trained on GPUs. And this will make a factor of about 10 or 20 of a difference. And so if you think about like some of the neural networks that are used today are trained for um, several uh, days, sometimes up to a week on a GPU. If you imagine this is a factor 20 faster than what was there before. Um, so this would maybe 
take months or maybe even a year to train on a CPU. So these things are just really not possible. Um, more recently, uh, people have even more dedicated hardware. So people are using uh, FPGAs and uh, TPUs to train neural networks. And as I mentioned for uh, the BERT architecture, uh, this is like training multiple days on multiple TPUs. So people use uh, clusters of dedicated hardware to train these uh, huge neural network models. And so um, these models would never be possible without the advances we have in hardware. There's definitely um, also some critical improvements that we'll talk about uh, later, which is the change of the nonlinearity to ReLU. Um, one of the first innovations was dropout, um, batch normalization, residual neural networks, and the atom optimizer. And we'll talk about each of them in turn. And um, like mo most of these things uh, are still being used. For not all of them, it's entirely clear uh, what the benefits are, or um, but uh, things that just uh, in practice have shown to be uh, beneficial. All right, but now let's really get started on your networks and um, how do your networks work and what they are. First, I want to go back to logistic regression and um, draw logistic regression in a slightly different way. So as you know, logistic regression or linear regression uh, for that matter is basically you have an input feature vector. Here I represented this as x0, x1, x2, x3. And then you have a linear coefficient um, that I wrote here as uh, w0, w1, w2, w3. You compute the inner product of the two. And in linear regression, this gives you the response. In logistic regression, this gives you the log odds. So you would put it through the uh, sigmoid nonlinearity to get the uh, probabilistic prediction. And so, because people, uh, when they came up with neural networks, were sort of inspired by brain networks. They really like to uh, draw these diagrams of how neural networks are connected. And so, um, what is drawn here is really just an inner product between a vector and a coefficient vector. Um, but this is how this is usually drawn. So, an error just means usually um, multiplication with a single weight or a single coefficient. And so the multiple inputs to um, one of these nodes is just um, computing a sum. And sometimes there are some activation functions. So here in this case, there would be um, for logistic regression, there would be a sigmoid that is applied to the sum of the, uh, or to the inner product here, to the, so, so of, to the sum of x0 times w0 and so on, but this is not really represented in the picture usually. And so, oh, and so here, each of these circles sort of corresponds to an input feature, the arrows correspond to weights, and the uh, this circle corresponds to the output. So each of these uh, nodes and each of these errors is basically just a single floating point number. You really should not confuse these with the kind of uh, uh, pictures I draw, uh, drew um, when we talked about um, lin uh, latent derivative allocation. When we talked about latent derivative allocation, I also drew like circles and errors. But the circles and errors and latent derivative allocation were representing um, random variables. Whereas here, we're really just, re these are, uh, just representing single floating point numbers. And so you could say this is maybe like a little bit of a complicated way to write it down um, an inner product. But this is sort of how people would do it. And so I just wanted to make you uh, a little bit familiar with that. All right, so this is a logistic regression drawn as a neural network. Um, the way that neural networks uh, work is then by adding an additional um, uh, hidden layer, which basically means instead of having the output be um, an inner product of the input layer with some coefficient weight, we have another vector in between. And so now, uh, basically for each uh, node, so each number in the hidden layer, 
we have um, an inner product between one weight vector that is for each of the hidden layers um, and the input. And so you compute um, a, an inner product to compute this one, you compute a different inner product to compute this one, and so on. And then you compute another inner product to compute the output. I wrote this down here uh, at the bottom as um, so, uh, basically the hidden layer is just um, some um, weight matrix. So because you have now basically one inner product corresponding to each activation, the hidden layer, the whole thing uh, is a matrix. So you have the uh, weight matrix times the input X plus some biases that I called B1. So the biases are also usually not drawn. And um, this F here is um, what is known as a nonlinearity, and I'll come to that in a second. So once we computed that, then um, given this uh, HX, which is known as the hidden activations, we have uh, some connections to the output here. Actually, given that there's only one output, W2 would just be a vector and you would compute W2 times H of X plus B2, which will be two is now a single number. It's the bias of the output unit. Um, quick question. Do you guys hear singing in the background? Um, because then I might need to go somewhere else. No. No singing? Okay. I, I, I live above a, a, a prayer room. Um, Just started hearing it a little bit. All right. Now I think, it, it, please let me know if it gets distracting, um, then I'll try to go somewhere else. So it might be a little bit tricky. Um, okay. As long as you can understand me, I guess it's fine. So, okay. Um, now, so the, in, the output is given as basically um, W2 times uh, H of X and H of X is uh, W1 times X. And so if both of these were still, uh, were just linear operations, then we could write this as a single matrix multiplication. And the whole thing would just be a logistic regression model. This was actually the case for the um, word vectors we looked at last time, where basically, um, the whole thing was just uh, two matrix multiplications. If you just have two matrix multiplications, it basically just means you have a low rank constraint on your um, on the model, um, but it's still a linear model. Here, to make the whole thing more powerful than just logistic regression, um, we introduce a nonlinearity that is f of x. And um, I think I'll have a picture of the typically f of x uh, in a, a little bit, but basically this is often the 10h or also uh, it used to be the, uh, uh, the sigmoid linearity similar to logistic regression or these days the rectified linear unit. And the point of this is that basically to make the whole process nonlinear, you can think of this now as the hidden layer being um, some nonlinear basis and then you're learning a linear model on top of this nonlinear basis. But you're learning both the weight vectors W1 and W2. Um, if this was a, a regression problem, maybe um, G would be the identity. If this was a classification problem, G might be again logistic or um, softmax if you have multi-class classification. Now, um, the more units there are in the hidden layer, the more com complexity you add and the bigger the weight matrices get. So one way to add complexity to your model is to make these models very wide and have uh, very big weight, ma weight matrices. Another way to add complexity is to um, add more hidden layers. So instead of just having a single hidden layer, you can have multiple matrix multiplications. So here, uh, what's labeled as one would be the input vector. And um, then there's two hidden layers um, 
here, so in blue, then there's an output layer in orange. And so connecting each of the hidden layer, there would be a weight matrix. And they don't have to be the same size. Each of these layers could be a different size. Uh, typically, the output layer is not as big because it corresponds to the number of classes in multi-class classification. In a regression problem, you typically would have just a single output unit. So as I said, so there is uh, several choices for these nonlinear activations, and by far the most common are um, 10H and rectified linear. And in particular, like these days, basically everybody uses rectified linear, I think, unless they um, need a smooth function for some reason. And so a rectified linear unit is just uh, the maximum of zero and x. So it's the identity for positive numbers, and it's a constant zero for negative numbers. And uh, you might be familiar with this as like being a very, very simple like spline. Um, and so just having this maximum between uh, zero and the response allows you to model arbitrary nonlinear functions. And so this is much, much more powerful than um, just having a linear model. And we'll see some examples of this soon. The more traditional choice is the 10H uh, nonlinearity, which you can sh see here. Um, one of the downsides of using this um, has been, that has been found is that, um, as you can see, this flattens, flattens off. This whole thing here is uh, learned with gradient descent, as we'll see soon. And if you compute a gradient, say over here, the gradient is very, uh, very flat. And so it's very hard if you're if you, a response is very big, that actually means your gradient is very small because the function is very flat. So um, the uh, rectified linear unit doesn't really have this problem of the gradients becoming very small because it's basically just um, a maximum of zero and one, uh, of zero and the identity. So these are the basic ideas. You basically have um, one or uh, more matrix multiplications um, and then uh, a co linear connection to the output layer or linear connection to the output layer plus some activation uh, on the output layer for classification. So there's a question, uh, can you explain where it would replace uh, ReLU with uh, leaky ReLU? Okay, so I'll probably not go into all of the things, all of the variants that there are possible because there's just so much out there and there's like, I don't know how many people have written about uh, neural networks every day. Um, the reason why you want, might want to have a regular value is that basically if you look at this piece here, the gradient is completely zero. And so, because the function is constant. And so if, you, uh, if your activation is somewhere here, you would have no gradient and would mean no learning happens. The, Ricky, the leaky relu basically gives you like a little bit of a gradient here as well. That's the intuition. I don't think it's, yeah. I have to check the news, how much people are using leaky uh, relus these days. The fashions on this are very short lived. Um, and so I'm actually not sure if this is something people use a lot right now or not. Okay, just a, uh, before we go a little bit more to the uh, math of it, and um, uh, just a little bit uh, more like o o overview. So the thing is that so neural networks have been used for all kinds of tasks, and we'll focus mostly on supervised neural networks for classification and regression. Um, so we saw arguably already some so unsupervised neural networks when we talked about the word vectors. Uh, which are very, very simple self-supervised neural networks. So the strengths of uh, neural networks are really if, uh, trying to learn very complex relationships that are very nonlinear uh, on very, very large data sets. Um, and so in particular, if you uh, have data that is text or video or images or audio or maybe time series, and you have huge amounts of data, you should definitely use neural networks. Um, 
For some of these, for say images and text, even if you have small amounts of data, you might uh, use neural networks, but you will uh, use off the shelf models that already have been trained for you. Um, the challenges of using neural networks is that these are um, non-convex optimization, meaning we have this, uh, when we learn them, we have to solve this optimization problem, but uh, it's a very tricky optimization problem to solve. So for SVMs or neural networks, there was a convex optimization problem. We could optimize it and it's sort of uh, no problem. Um, for like things like NMF, you need to, basically you need to do random restarts to find a good optimum. The same is true for neural networks, though uh, training is so slow that it's often not really plausible to do multiple random restarts. And so you just um, have to deal with the fact that your result is dependent on random initialization. They're also uh, notoriously slow to train. And so um, it's a good idea to train on specialized hardware like GPUs or TPUs. Uh, some of you already discussed on Piazza um, using Google Cool Lab, which is probably what we will be using for the uh, last homework. So Google Cool Lab actually gives you free access to GPUs and uh, TPUs, um, which is pretty great. Um, otherwise, it's quite, quite a hassle to get access to uh, GPUs unless you have a high-end gaming computer. Um, so as I said, there's like many, many variants of neural networks and um, we'll only talk about basically the most vanilla ones and then later on we'll talk about convolutional neural networks. But there's also gated recurrent neural networks, lo uh, long short-term memory, recursive neural networks, variational autoencoder, generative adversarial networks, deep reinforcement learning, and many, 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 many more things. And um, probably for each of them, you could have like a whole lecture series um, like a whole course on, on each of them. Um, so we are only going to go over things uh, quite, quite briefly. So let's come back to, to the math uh, behind it. So as I said, at the, if, so this is uh, now doing a single hidden layer neural network. Uh, this is the prediction formula. So you start with your features x1, you do matrix multiplication with w1 plus some bias uh, b1. So w1 is um, matrix, b1 is a vector. Um, you use a nonlinearity like the real nonlinearity, um, which is f, and uh, then the result is your hidden activations. You multiply them with another weight matrix. A w2. If you're just doing regression with a single output, w2 would just be a vector, otherwise it's a matrix again, um, and you have another bias b2. So now um, the whole thing is like learned using um, like optimization, so we want to minimize some loss of our predictions um, on the training data set, and we want to minimize with respect to W1, uh, W2, B1, B2, of course. And so um, the losses are like uh, pretty standard. So squared loss is used for regression usually and cross entropy for classification. So it's basically the same as you would do with the uh, linear model. Um, so the training, in a sense, is the same as for linear regression, or sorry, the loss is the same for as for linear regression or logistic regression, only that the expression for your output is much more complicated now. And so, um, part of um, so okay, so now we have this formula this way. We could just uh, throw. Um, a standard solver to the as we haven't really talked about optimization so far for the for the problems when I gave you like a linear model I said okay then this is optimized um, and because these are convex optimization problems how you optimize them doesn't matter that much for neural networks because they are not linear optimization problems how you try to optimize them actually matters a lot and um, so I want to talk a little bit more about how this is usually done 
usually gradient based uh, uh, methods are used. And so the first thing we need to do is compute the gradient of this function. And um, you could say, well, computing gradient is, uh, is easy, and it is kind of easy, but um, it's particularly easy to do if you use what's known as backpropagation. Backpropagation is a way to compute uh, the gradients with respect to the weights and the biases. So what you need to compute is the gradient of the loss with respect to the weights and the biases. This is uh, on your training data set. And um, if you would try to compute this sort of naively, this might be a little bit tricky. We do a lot of um, repeated computations, but um, basically backpropagation is a way to compute this uh, very efficiently. So backpropagation is not an optimization procedure. It's just a way to compute the gradients. And so it just uses the chain rule, basically, uh, to rewrite the gradient of, um, say, so what we need is the gradient of the, of the loss. If we say we do regression and the loss is a squared loss, um, the gradient of the loss is uh, just linear, so that's uh, not so that's easy. And then uh, we want to com we want to compute the gradient of the output with respect to the weights. And we can uh, in the first layer, and we can decompose it in this way, where um, the first term is the gradient of the layer above. The second term is the gradient of the nonlinearity, and the last term is the input to the first layer. And so um, if you have, imagine having many, many layers. So modern neural networks sometimes have like 100 or 200 layers. And so um, backpropagation basically is able to compute um, the gradient for each weight matrix um, starting from the end um, using the input to each of the layers, the gradient of the nonlinearity, and the gradient of the um, layer towards the end. So I, call, I said layer above. Layer above means towards the output. And so um, in the end, what, uh, so this, and this computation is called the backward pass. So the computation uh, of the forward pass is just computing the output. Um, given the features and the weight matrices, the backward pass basically means computing the gradients of all the weights inside the network um, using the, uh, the things computed in the forward pass plus the gradients of the nonlinearities. And so usually in training a neural network, you're alternating this forward pass where you're making predictions using the network, you, you compute the loss of the predictions, and then you do backward pass, which computes the gradients using a chain rule. So if you paid attention, you'd say, uh, but wait, we have this uh, rectified linear unit, and this doesn't have a gradient, obviously, because it, uh, it's um, non-differentiable. So people don't really talk about it this a lot and say they're doing gradient descent, but actually you can't, really, you can't do gradient descent on modern neural networks because of the um, radial activation. And uh, what is like, theoretically what you're doing is called subgradient descent. If you can do the same as gradient descent optimization, uh, if you have a continuous function that doesn't have gradients by picking any subgradient. So here, there's only one point where there's no gradient. It's that this is the point at zero. And so um, formally, uh, you could pick any uh, tangent that is below the function, like any, uh, and it will give you, uh, and you can do, use that instead of a gradient and the optimization process will still find a local minimum. In reality, um, this is a floating point number and will never be zero. So we don't really have to worry about it too much. But from a mathematical perspective, um, what we're doing is subgradient descent because there's no gradient at zero. Uh, 
All right, so now let's say we, we computed the gradient or the subgradient with backpropagation. And um, now we want to optimize our weights and biases. We could do a vanilla gradient descent, which is um, we compute the loss over the whole um, training data set. So here uh, I would be the, is the index of the layer and J is the index of the sample. Um, so we could sum up the gradients over all the samples and then update W. Eta here is a, a learning rate. Um, the problem with this is that it's actually um, uh, quite slow because um, computing the, uh, the forward and backward paths in a neural network is quite computationally intensive. And so if we have to compute the gradient and the, uh, for all of the training samples before we do an update, um, yeah, this will converge very, very slowly. An alternative would be um, to do stochastic gradient descent uh, or online gradient descent that I, um, that I mentioned before um, when we talked about uh, gradient boosting, I think. So there the idea is to sample one point at random or just iterate over all the points. And after you process one point, you immediately do a gradient update. So when you do this, then um, after seeing each individual example, you would do a gradient update. However, the most common form is that you pick a batch size, sometimes, or often like something like 64 or 256 or 512, something like this, and you sum up this many samples. So you slice your data set into batches of a particular size and you accumulate the gradient over these batches. So this is an in-between of um, computing the gradient of the whole data set and then doing an uh, update uh, and just looking at a single sample. So you're looking at, in this case, um, M sam wait, yeah, uh, M samples and um, I said so M could be something like 64. This has um, two benefits. I think the main benefit is that it be better utilizes the hardware. So this is something that's maybe not super obvious, um, but both CPUs and, G and particular GPUs are optimized for, or can do a much better matrix multiplication than a series of vector vector multiplications or vector matrix multiplications in this case. And so um, basically the, the cache is used much more efficiently if you use mini batches. And so you can just do more computation in uh, the same time if you use mini batches. There's also um, another benefit that the aggregating over multiple samples might be more stable and might allow you to use bigger learning rates. And uh, so the size, the batch size is um, a hyperparameter of the optimization. So uh, different batch, si batch sizes will give you different results because um, this is a non-convex optimization problem. And so what uh, the minimum you will find in the end depends on all the choices you make during optimization. So if you, um, even if you keep the same random initialization, if you pick a, a batch size of 64, you will get a different result than if you pick a batch size of 512. So maybe this gives you some idea of like how kind of uh, finicky it can be to, to optimize uh, neural networks. All right, so that, let's say, so here I assumed we have some constant learning rate uh, eta. And um, in principle, you can do that. But um, as I mentioned, when we discussed gradient descent, having a constant eta is not uh, usually a good idea. So often you want to decrease eta over time. And there's like uh, many, many tricks 
uh, of how to decrease eta. So some people decrease eta uh, whenever the validation error uh, stops decreasing, or people just use an exponentially decaying schedule. Um, the, and uh, yeah, th there, there's lots of ways to do this. But um, what people have found to be even better is if we have separate adaptive ETAs for each entry of um, the weight matrix. So each uh, number that we're learning will actually have its own learning rate. You can think of this a little bit like uh, second order methods. So in, um, in second order methods, so uh, like uh, Newton optimization, you also have, um, you're not only using the gradient, but you're multiplying the gradient by some factor that depends on the second derivative. Computing the second derivative in a neural network would usually be way too slow. And so I, I had mentioned this, um, have I mentioned this? I might have mentioned LBFGS, which is like a standard optimizer that people use. So LBFGS basically um, uh, tries to estimate the Hessian while you're learning. Um, heuristics that are used for neural networks are different from LBFGS, but in a sense, they try to do something similar and try to uh, estimate how fast can you learn uh, each particular weight entry. So um, one of the algorithms that is very uh, popular is Adam. Um, I don't think I'll go through Adam because probably um, this week people are using three different variants of Adam that are not the same as last week. So um, often these have some magic numbers, uh, but they're implemented in all of the standard libraries. So you don't have to implement them yourself. Um, uh, that's actually kind of funny that, um, so Adam became very, very popular a couple of years ago. And um, then uh, after it has been widely used and created many state-of-the-art results, um, someone pointed out that there was actually a mistake in the math in the proof of the paper, and the algorithm uh, doesn't converge even on simple toy problems. And so even though the algorithm was wrong, it gave state-of-the-art results. Um, then people fixed it and uh, I don't know if it even uh, improved the, the actual results, but uh, so I'm not sure if people still use the original Adam because uh, it was proven to not converge um, in some conditions. And uh, I think that's like an interesting anecdote about um, uh, your network research, like something might work even though the math says it doesn't. Uh, yeah, so there's, um, I, I linked um, a, a couple of papers. Uh, also here, this for, Sebastian uh, Ruder has this uh, overview of different great descent algorithms. If you're really deep into neural networks, you probably want to check out what are people doing uh, like right now. And as I said, I mean, maybe it doesn't change every week, but it will change every couple of months as, um, because the research moves very quickly. I would usually rely on the things that are provided in some of the off-the-shelf libraries, and um, we'll discuss them a little bit later. Um, generally, my rule of thumb, if you don't want to dive too deep, is that um, if you have a small data set, then use something like LBFGS, which is an off-the-shelf optimizer and you don't have to worry about it too much. Uh, however, it will be pretty slow uh, because it's a batch algorithm. If you have bigger data sets, I would use Atom or uh, RMSProp, which is another popular algorithm. Um, but there's like dozens of variants of both of these. If um, you have the time and nerve, sometimes uh, actually hand tuning the schedule can yield, to, yield better results then uh, using one of these heuristics. Um, uh, but th yeah, this might be more complicated. So if you use Atom, one of the things that people like about it is that it's very robust and it will usually just work. 
All right, so now um, let's get started doing some applica uh, actual applications. We'll start off by um, doing some neural networks with scikit-learn. This is mostly to give you a feel of it. I wouldn't really recommend using the neural networks in scikit-learn for anything but toy problems. And uh, we'll later discuss some of uh, the more popular deep learning libraries. But to get your feet wet, maybe uh, using uh, the scikit-learn ones it, uh, is sort of reasonable and will let you play around with some of the hyperparameters. The big caveat here is that um, scikit-learn doesn't support GPUs, so this will all be done on the CPU and so therefore pretty slow. So if you're gonna do scikit-learn, the uh, benefit obviously is it has the standard scikit-learn interface and um, so you can just apply it to your fa uh, favorite two moon data set and um, see what it does. So by default, this uses the uh, ReLU nonlinearity, and so the decision boundary will be nonlinear, but piecewise linear. And so you can see see that this is like uh, pretty ziggity zaggedy here. Like so you can you can see that there's piece it's piecewise linear, but it cuts out this point, it cuts out this point. Um, also, as I said, so here because it's a very small data set, I set the solver to LVFGS. Uh, by default, the solver is um, as I said, so um, given that it's a non-convex optimization uh, procedure, even if I use something like LBFGS, um, which is pretty robust, it will depend on the initialization. So here there is um, the results of uh, several different random states, and you can see that they are all uh, look somewhat different. Um, I think what they all have in common is that they have zero training set errors. So um, by default, the neural network has a size has a hidden a single hidden layer of size 100, and so this network is probably way too flexible to um, to fit this data set, and so it will kind of overfit um, on this very small toy problem. And so you can see here the different random states just make it overfit in different ways, but uh, all of them have zero training set error. So one way to change the complexity of the model is to change the number of hidden layers or the size of the hidden layers. So here first I just uh, decrease the hidden layer size from 100 to five. You can see the model becomes much more simple. So um, in theory, it should be, um, the decision boundary should be um, made, up, uh, made up of five linear pieces. Uh, you can only see four here. Um, or, no, I, I don't, yeah, you can see four here. Maybe one of them isn't used. Maybe one is like a global adjustment or something like this. <clears throat> but you can see that now the function is much, much simpler and you can actually see that it has some training set error. This is not, so you could use neural networks like this and try to build very, very simple neural networks. This is actually not how they're usually used. Usually people use networks that are um, so compli com uh, complicated they can express any function, but um, you just learn them uh, with a lot of data and uh, often they find something that will actually generalize. Um, in scikit-learn, if you want multiple hidden layers, you can just say hidden layer size is equal to a tuple. And so here I have three hidden layers, um, each with a hundred uh, hidden units. And so um, if you look at, if, uh, I think it's um, helpful to think of the number of parameters that are learned in a model. And so here we have uh, two features in the input, then 10 hidden uh, units, then 10 hidden units, then 10 hidden units, and then one feature, in the, uh, one output uh, unit. And so the first weight matrix is two times 10, the second is 10 times 10, the third is 10 times 10, the last one is 10 times one. 
Another thing that you can change, obviously, is the activation function. So here, by default, we're using um, uh, ReLU, as I mentioned. If we have relatively few units, as, such as here, you can see that it's still piecewise linear. Um, if we use <clears throat> a 10H activation function, you will see the results are much more smooth. So in uh, many real applications, it doesn't matter so much. And ha having faster learning matters much more. And so people would uh, ten uh, the tendency use uh, ReLU over 10H. But if you want it to look nice and smooth, you can always use uh, 10H if you like. You can also use uh, them, obviously, for regression. So here is, um, and this is implemented in the MLP regressor. Again, this is a toy data set, so I'm just using LBFGS. For a large data set, uh, you would use Atom, which is the default. And um, you can see here, uh, with ReLU, you get something that has sharp corners. And with Tana H, you get something that's much more smooth. So I already mentioned that we can uh, control the complexity by controlling the number of parameters. So by a number of parameters, what I mean is the number of weights that we learn. So we can make the network wider, so add more hidden units uh, in width, or we can make the network deeper, meaning we add more hidden layers. And uh, <clears throat> But the way that I would usually uh, measure the um, how complex the neural network is, or something that is a reasonable approximation for how compli complex the network is, is the number of parameters in total. Um, other ways to control the complexity are regularization. So this is often uh, called weight decay in, in neural networks. So weight decay just means L2 regularization. So it's basically the same as in rich regression or as you have in um, a penalized logistic regression or in SVMs. You can force the Ws to be uh, uh, small. And so basically, um, if you add a term alpha times norm of W to your loss function. And um, th th this is quite commonly done. You can also do early stopping. Uh, so early stopping here means stop doing gradient descent. So you're not actually optimize the problem to uh, a local optimum on the training data set. But instead, at some point, you stop optimizing. So even, so even though you haven't uh, found an, a local optimum yet, um, you just stop learning because you find that the validation loss uh, stops decreasing or starts to increase. So basically, you can detect in, within the optimization procedure when uh, overfitting happens, and you can stop learning then. And finally, um, I think I'll talk about this more next time, you can do uh, dropout, which is a, another regularization technique that basically adds noise into the training procedure. and um, is also a very good way to regularize a network during learning. So the regularization parameter, the weight decay parameter, is called alpha, just as in which. And so uh, if we want, so here I'm using the breast cancer data set, and I'm using, uh, I keep the default of having 100 hidden units, and I just um, search for the regularization parameter alpha uh, and see if I can find, find a good network. And you can see here that, um, well, as you would expect, the training error goes down, uh, sorry, the training accuracy goes down as you increase regularization. And uh, while the, the error bars are quite, uh, uh, quite big on this here, but maybe we would find the optimum here, um, uh, higher, uh, more highly regularized, uh, 
uh, network is probably more preferable, so maybe we would pick alpha equal to 10. Uh, that has the biggest mean, though it has a higher standard deviation than if you pick alpha equal to um, 10 to the minus 2. You can also grid search the hidden layer sizes. Uh, you can also obviously search both of them at the same time. So here, um, I just did one and then I did the other. And um, so here, I, I um, grid search the hidden layer sizes. And so I pick a single hidden layer with 10, 50, 100, or 500, and then two hidden layers with 10, 50, 100, or 500 units. There's nothing really that forces you to have hidden layers of similar sizes. Um, on tabular data, that's something that's quite commonly done. So um, it just, uh, just simplifies things, but I could also have the two hidden layers have different sizes. This is something that we'll see a lot in convolutional neural networks, but in, in like uh, vanilla neural networks uh, like these, usually um, the hidden layers all have the same size. And you can see here that um, well, like the plotting is a little bit tricky because it's not really a linear thing. So maybe I shouldn't have shouldn't have made lines between uh, between these. But um, you can see that for a 50, um, uh, 50 hidden units, uh, that seems to be the best or maybe 100 hidden units, but a single layer seems to be better than two layers. This is also like, this is a super small toy data set. So this is not something I would usually use uh, neural networks on. It's um, just like scikit-learn doesn't scale so well, so I didn't want to run this with MNIST. So you could run scikit-learn on MNIST, but it will probably take a little bit. All right. So now I want to talk about how you actually would do this. As I said, scikit-learn is probably not ideal. Um, so, and there's two reasons. A, it is slow, and B, it's not very flexible. And um, there's a tons of de uh, deep learning libraries out there. And I just want to talk a little bit about uh, what they do and um, sort of what the important aspects of these libraries are, are that uh, you should think about. So if you want to um, write your own neural network, it, you might do it, uh, something like this. So uh, there's something, you initialize it, and then you would have a forward and a backward pass. In the forward pass, you pass, you compute the activations of each of the layers. Uh, uh, so you do like the matrix multiplication and add the biases to do the nonlinearity. And then the backward pass, you imp implement back propagation and compute the gradients um, of each of the weights. Um, this is like relatively straightforward if you have a simple neural network like the one uh, we discussed so far. If you have more complicated neural networks, this can be uh, get really, really tricky and annoying and error prone. And so um, something that people tended to do pretty early on is to um, automate the process of uh, computing the uh, backward pass. So basically, Writing down gradients is kind of error prone, and uh, you might not write them down in a very effective way. So what people are uh, trying to do is um, just write down the forward pass and have a program uh, compute the backwards pass for you. This is, act, this is known as auto diff. Auto diff in itself is actually relatively simple to implement. Um, There, there, okay, maybe I shouldn't talk too much in detail about this, but there's several ways to implement autodiff. Um, here's one that I stole from uh, the MXNet um, documentation. Basically, 
here I define an array that can uh, compute the gradient of, uh, of multiplication and addition. And so you can see this is like, uh, even if you uh, like don't, don't worry about the code too much, this is like one slide full of code to compute a pretty simple um, auto diff um, process. So romantic differentiation is actually not something magical. It's basically you're hard coding the back propagation step for each forward propagation step. And you keep track of what were the steps you're doing in the forward pass. And then um, you can just um, have, you just walk, can walk back on this uh, chain of operations you did. And for each chain, uh, for each operation in the chain, you had to write down the derivative. And so all the alternative libraries, basically, they hard code the derivative for each of the operations. And um, then they just walk through the operations uh, backward. If you want to do this in an efficient way, um, that's another story. Um, but this is an example of the array cloud I just defined. So let's say you have uh, two arrays that you call A and B. And uh, they're both two by two bit arrays. We, we do the, um, the product of the two. And then we add a vector to it. And then we can look at the value. So this is like what NumPy would give you if you multiply two, um, two vectors and then add a number to it. But you can also compute the gradient at any value. And so let's say I want to compute the gradient at uh, uh, value 1. And um, then this returns the gradient for uh, both A and B. But, and this is just based on this like one slide of code. Um, So, um, so this is something that you definitely want to have if you want to write uh, neural networks yourself. If you want something that can compute the backward pass automatically, if you write down the forward pass. Um, another thing that you want is you probably want GPU support, um, which is also like scikit-learn doesn't give you, but all of uh, the other uh, deep neural networks libraries will give you that. Um, most of the libraries only support NVIDIA GPUs. And uh, NVIDIA obviously has an interest in it staying that way. Um, so you can look at the NVIDIA website of like the performance of some of the GPUs that they're selling. Um, running deep learning with AMD GPUs is like much more tricky. Um, there's also specialized uh, hardware, both from NVIDIA. So NVIDIA is selling specialized hardware, I think, for uh, neural networks. Um, I don't think, I'm not sure if Google is selling theirs yet, um, but like a, a couple of people are working on custom hardware. Um, probably the easiest way to, to get access to that is to use Google Cloud, um, because then you don't need to worry about it. Um, oh yeah, and so as I said, so here, um, like new GPUs can be much, much faster. So here, uh, this graph that I got from NVIDIA shows like a 30 fold speed up. I mean, 30 fold is quite a lot. Um, you should, if someone reports 100x speed up on using GPUs, their CPU implementation was bad. So you should, if uh, if someone uh, is telling you they have 100x speed up, uh, they're probably like not measuring things properly. Um, however, this is much much more than what you could have with other uh, learning algorithms. So I mentioned for gradient boosting when we talked about it, um, there is. Uh, GPU support for gradient boosting in like XGBoost and LightGBM and probably in CatBoost. If you do that, you will get like a 3x speed up or maybe like a 5x speed up. 
in neural networks, you might get like 10, 10 or 20 uh, X speed up. So it's sort of more worth it to do this for neural networks than it is to do it for uh, gradient boosting. Also, you can more easily distribute uh, neural network trading over um, a cluster. So, as I said, uh, for the program to automatically compute the backward pass for you to compute gradients, um, it needs to keep track of um, the operations that are done in the forward pass. And so, um, this is usually done using a, uh, like some form of graph of the computation. Here's the representation of how this might look like for TensorFlow. Um, one of the benefits of maintaining this graph is also that you can then um, inspect the results more easily uh, and you can um, or and the library can optimize the um, the storage for you and the order of computations so if you have the whole architecture stored as a computation graph this makes it much easier for um, yeah, to optimize over this graph so things like TensorFlow basically do have graph optimization um, routines in there that um, allow to automatically determine which results can be overwritten, which results can be computed in parallel, and which results depend on each other. Or maybe which parts of the network don't need to be uh, computed at all. And um, this is something that is uh, actually quite essential to um, doing deep learning efficiently, but it's something that's happening usually more under the hood these days. Um, so these are sort of the standard features that uh, you want from any deep learning framework is uh, auto diff, uh, GPU support, um, potentially support for other custom hardware. Uh, you want the optimization and inspection of the computation graph. Um, and these three things you basically have for uh, all of the deep learning libraries. For some uh, kinds of problems, uh, particular in NLP, but also in computer vision, you might want to um, generate this compute graph on the fly, and you might want to distribute over multiple GPUs or clusters. And this is not necessarily support, and these are two are not necessarily supported by all of the um, libraries. So the main two libraries that you're probably, or the main two deep learning frameworks that um, uh, you're probably familiar with are TensorFlow and PyTorch. Um, so these basically are not really deep learning libraries, but deep learning, uh, deep learning frameworks. So they provide auto diff support, they provide the computation graph, they provide GPU support, and um, but they don't really, they don't implement neural networks themselves. There's uh, another one called Chainer that I think is not that commonly used these days. Um, and there used to be one called Theano that was developed in Josh Benji's lab in Montreal, I think mostly. Um, but I think this is, this is not maintained anymore. Uh, it's sort of a precursor to TensorFlow in some sense. And uh, based on these, so these basically give you something that is these days called a tensor, but it's actually not a tensor, it's an array. Um, that allows you to do auto diff and optimize computation. On top of these, usually then sit uh, deep learning libraries. And so um, maybe I should have put uh, PyTorch.nn here. So um, these are more high level libraries that uh, actually implement neural networks. So there's Keras. Uh, Keras could be backed by TensorFlow, CNTK, or Theano. Um, now Keras is sort of absorbed into TensorFlow and more, uh, and I think sort of probably these days it's easiest just to use Keras with TensorFlow. Um, PyTorch has PyTorch.nn. Um, Chainer has sort of its own thing. And there's another one called MXNet uh, that uh, Amazon really likes to use 
it also has its um, its own computation framework, but I don't think it's really used outside of MXNet. And so each of them has like some way to do this auto diff, some way to do represent these compute graphs, and uh, some way to do distributed learning, and so on. Um, so the the main uh, okay so. I want to compare the two main ones of these, which are TensorFlow and PyTorch in a little bit more detail. And so in this lecture, we'll basically not, not use either of them. We'll be using Keras, which is the more high level library. Uh, but you're probably going to run into uh, TensorFlow or uh, PyTorch code at some point. Um, so TensorFlow actually changed very drastically recently. Um, so uh, both TensorFlow and PyTorch itself are pretty down to the metal, and I wouldn't usually use them. So as we're doing in this class, for uh, most tasks, I would use some other off-the-shelf library. Um, so the way TensorFlow used to look, and the way I imagine a lot of the TensorFlow code in production still uh, looks, is that it has uh, three distinct steps. And even though people don't use this interface a lot anymore, I think it's still very useful to have these concepts uh, present. The first step is to build the computation graph. Um, so say using uh, array operations and functions. And so this would be like your forward and backward pass and the gradient descent. But you're not actually doing any computation. You're just building the graph that says what should be computed. Then you create an optimizer attached to this graph that says, so this is how we actually compute the gradients. And then in the end, you run the actual computation by uh, giving, providing it to data or iterating over the data and doing the forward and backward passes. And so these are really three distinct things where you have uh, the function that you write down as a computation graph, you have the optimizer that operates on the function, and then you actually run the optimizer um, over the function on, um, on the data. Uh, in uh, TensorFlow 2.0, um, something that's called eager mode is used, which is different from this, where basically all three of them happen at once. Uh, this is modeled after PyTorch. So uh, PyTorch came out uh, a bit after TensorFlow, and um, People that write research code really loved uh, PyTorch much more than TensorFlow. And so TensorFlow in its most recent version uh, tried to emulate some of the features of uh, PyTorch. And so now TensorFlow 2.0 uh, looks much more like PyTorch in using this eager mode. So in, in the traditional mode, um, this is what it would look like. I just, I still have this here. So to show you the separation of these uh, three fa phases, um, because I think this is actually quite instructive. So here, uh, in the beginning, we just declare what is going to happen. So here I created um, a 1D regression data set. So this is taken from the PyTorch, from an, oh, sorry, from an old TensorFlow documentation. Um, I, I created a 1D regression problem. And here I create a graph. So this is just linear regression. I have a weight vector that's actually just uh, a single number and a bias that's also a single number. Um, and I say y is w times theta plus b. So these w, b, and y are all just abstract. Uh, you can think of them as like symbolic variables. So there's no actual computation happening here. So this y is not actually computed. So then I write down the loss, which is y minus y data r squared and uh, mean. So this is the mean squared error. Again, no computation happens here. This is just a symbolic representation of the computation. Um, then I create an optimizer. Here, just a gradient descent optimizer with the learning right 0.5. And so, here, um, the optimizer is bound to the loss function, but this, this still doesn't do anything. 
And then finally, um, I'm starting the computation uh, run, which allocates the variables. And so all the work is done here. This actually runs the graph and runs the optimizer. Uh, there's a question, what does this mean? Uh, here, so this, this, the first one is the size, and the second and third is the range for the random uniform variable. So there's a, it's initialized randomly between minus one and one. They could just initialize it for zero, with zero for this problem, but they initialize it the way it's usually done for neural networks. The PyTorch code um, and also the TensorFlow 2.0 code uh, looks much more like this, where um, you basically do the device setup in the beginning. And then um, the graph is created on the fly while you're doing computations. And so here, um, this is actually not, uh, wait, did I change it? Oh yeah, I changed it to also be linear regression, I think. Um, and so here, the there's no separate declaration of the computation. Um, and so this is basically, it's called eager mode in TensorFlow because you execute as soon as you write down. And so here, if you call ypred is x uh, dot matrix population w1, this is actually executed eagerly. And then the loss is also comp computed directly. And, uh, but it still stores the computation while doing the eager computation. And then if I do loss.backward, it does the backward propagation on the loss. And then I, uh, I do the learning rate update. So you can see that this has like a quite a, quite a different flavor to it. And so this is um, much more easy to write in this, uh, in this uh, eager mode. Um, but it's sort of the conceptual boundaries are not entirely as clear. And so you can see that researchers that only care about the math love this, while like this guy here, the original TensorFlow was probably written by some people that know a lot about systems and hardware, and they thought about it like this, um, which makes a lot of sense from a systems perspective, but it's not as user-friendly. So one of the benefits of not having the graph uh, explicitly be um, represented is that you can build it on the fly and you can have a different graph for each uh, sample. And this is something that you can do with PyTorch, but it's not as easily possible with TensorFlow. Oh, there's a question of what is this grad.0 doing? Grad.0 zeroes out a gradient. So by default, if you do backward, it accumulates the gradient. Um, so it adds to whatever is there degraded already. This is so you can have multiple, you can optimize multiple loss functions at once, basically. Um, uh, I, I'm not using, uh, I haven't really used PyTorch, but the common uh, bug that people is doing their PyTorch code is forget this line and not zero the, the gradient. And this will basically give you garbage. So I think it's, it's useful to understand these sort of differences in the, um, in the libraries, um, but I would recommend that both for this class and also for your work, don't use either of these if you can avoid it. If you're doing deep learning research, um, you probably want to use PyTorch because that's what most research, researchers are using. But uh, if you just, you know, if you want to do data science, if you want to build a model, um, Probably you want to write either Keras, which is what we're doing in this class, starting next time, or you want to use um, some of the high-level libraries on top of PyTorch. So there's a couple. There's PyTorch and N, which is like basically chip with PyTorch. Uh, I would argue it's not entirely as high-level as Keras. There's also a really cool library called FastAI that's much more like uh, user focused, and then there's a couple of other ones like Scorch and Ignite. Um, so basically for, for TensorFlow, there's basically Keras is like the, uh, the high level framework that I would argue most people are using. On PyTorch, there's a couple. Um, 
that would yeah probably go towards PyTorch NN or uh, Fast AI. Fast AI does like, in a sense, it's a little bit like spacey in that it's very like production oriented, um, and like it makes some decisions for you, which, which might be good if you want to get results fast. So there's one question, which is how should we choose uh, between PyTorch and TensorFlow for conducting academic research? So I think most of the community is moving more towards PyTorch. Um, but I think the thing that um, for me would be the highest priority is like, what does your team know and what do you know? Um, whoever you're collaborating with should be able to read your code. If you, if you love PyTorch, but all your collaborators know TensorFlow, maybe it makes sense to use TensorFlow so that people can review your code. So I would, um, it, or is there existing code that you want to build on? Usually um, any academic research builds on uh, existing research, in uh, particularly in deep neural networks, like things move so fast, you're probably adapting someone else's code with your ideas. And so um, if the code that you want to adapt is written in PyTorch, maybe use PyTorch. If the code you want to adapt is written in TensorFlow, maybe use TensorFlow. Um, so if there's no prior of like, what is your group doing or what people previously did, I would probably err towards PyTorch these days but it probably also shouldn't matter that much. Um, okay, another question is, are there any tasks that neural networks are worse at or no better than the models we've seen? Um, that de it depends on your data. So you can basically, it's impossible to say whether, um, like if I give you a data set, it's, um, that's like a tabular data set, I would argue it's impossible to say whether neural networks will be better on it or gradient boosting will be better on it. Um, and it might depend on the data set size, but it might also depend on non-obvious characteristics of the data set. For a tabular data set, I would probably uh, try gradient boosting for first before I try neural networks. If the task is image recognition, I will use uh, neural networks 100% of the time. And so, yeah, basically, if it's one of the domains uh, where neural networks are really established, use neural networks. If it's not, it wouldn't be the first thing to start with. Uh, I'd start with because they're generally uh, slower and more annoying to tune. Um, like. In the time that you made your um, first neural network run, I probably shipped my random forest to production. Um, so, yeah. If you have enough data, there might be, um, like, neural networks might work better than gradient boosting or they might not. It's, um, yeah, I, I think it's very hard to say a priori. All right, so um, that's it for today. Um, next time we'll talk about uh, Keras in a little bit more detail and some uh, more advanced tricks with um, and techniques for learning neural networks. Um, on, so I'll probably post the homework tomorrow or on Wednesday. Happy to answer any questions, otherwise I'll see you Wednesday.